Good evening. Welcome to our second session for the synoptic, well, business environment synoptic um, exam for level two. Um, so as we mentioned in the last session, this is the fairly new unit uh, for this Wells 22 syllabus. Uh, my name is Catherine and I am one of the tutors here at First Intuition and tonight we're going to be looking at uh, task two uh, on this exam um, and it does follow on quite nicely from our work from last week on task one. Um, we're going to be looking at the finance function again but in some different ways so um, kind of moving on to some of the other things that you will need to know. Uh, about the finance function, but then the main bulk of task two is looking at workload planning, um, which is a very useful um, skill to have. So we'll look at some of the questions on that. So hopefully that will be an interesting session for us. So we'll have a quick look through and just have a look at the task briefing. Um, first of all, as we've done on our previous session, we have find a nice colour, we'll go with yellow for our highlight tonight. So as I said, we're talking about the finance function again, but in a slightly different way. So whereas last time we were looking at a lot of the sort of um, responsibilities of a company, particularly limited companies in their reporting requirements and um, file, you know, filing and making sure that we've got the right information that is publicly available. We're now going to be looking more at um, kind of requirements for information, also sources of information, um, and maybe how we can also plan our workload, like you we were saying, um, and make sure that we're being as effective a worker as we can be. So we're going to have a look at that in a little bit. So the task says that we must be able to produce work in appropriate format, so we must be able to decide what the best way of completing a task is, and there is a little bit of that in the example question that we're going to look at shortly. We also have to be able to communicate effectively, looking at different sources of information, communicating that information in the best way, so we'll look at the different stages um, that we might be involved with in terms of data collection and processing, and then getting that um, data or information out to the people that need it. Um, so that'll be down sort of our, um, getting our source of information and then communicating that information as we've got on the screen there. And as I say, finally, planning the workload to meet the needs of the organisation. Okay, so it's quite it's a little varied on this task, um, but this is still very much um, maybe matching answers up, um, filling in blanks, picking from drop down lists. There is no written um, work on this task. So hopefully again, just easing you into this uh, exam in a, in a nice way. Um, so we'll have a little look at, at these areas, first of all, just to give you a bit of a recap, and then we'll get into the meat of the session and have a look at an example question for this task. Okay, so we've got two main sources of information. So first one we've got is that we've got our primary information. Um, we collect this for ourselves. So it could be that we're looking to get information from our own company, or it might be something like um, financial statements or budgetary information, production um, information. So it be like how many units we were able to produce in a certain period. We can then use that information to plan ahead maybe. Um, but we can also look at um, information from the, uh, that is external, so we've got things like market research, um, apologies for my terrible handwriting. Um, so yes, yeah, so we that will then maybe formulate our ideas around a new product or providing a new service. Um, could be looking at how our competitors in the market might be doing with a similar product or service, or they might not have a similar product or service and they're looking to diverge into a different area. So a lot of what we will do in terms of information gathering will be for that primary information purpose. But we do also have secondary information. So that might, that's not something that we're looking to collect ourselves. Um, it's usually collected by um, a third party. 
Um, I mean, the good example that we've got here is that there's usually some sort of government statistics on the number of children born each year. And that, that's something that I find really, really fascinating. I love to look at, um, like, I'm, I'm going a little bit off on a tangent here, bear with me. Um, like popular names in each year, like what's the most popular boys' name and girls' name in each year. Um, but that is collected usually by the Office for National Statistics, um, which is your government um, information gatherer, if you like. Um, and it might be that part of your role or part of your organisation's role is to provide data to the Office for National Statistics. And that's something that I used to have to do um, in one of my previous roles that we were asked about how many um, full-time and part-time members of staff we had each month and how many hours they've worked. And again, that formulates into employment data um, the government produces every month to show, you know, what's the unemployment rate, for example. So there's a lot of information out there that companies themselves may not have gathered, but that they are gathering that then will be useful for, again, maybe the, say the government planning for their own needs in terms of um, providing resources and providing services, um, but also that companies can then use um, maybe to plan for their own features um, based on that information. So you may be asked about that in the exam. Uh, it's just important to know the distinction between the two. The other thing that you may be asked about, um, although this is not mentioned in detail in this particular task that we're going to be looking at shortly, is how we communicate. So you may be familiar if we look at some of these, um, I shall highlight them up for um, some of these different um, different methods. Letters is maybe going out a little bit, um, and memos are definitely going out. As soon as the internet came in and emails started, memos just went out the door. So I'm sure, I mean, I don't think I've ever worked in a company where memos have been a regular thing. Um, but your main ones are like your emails, um, spreadsheets, we love a spreadsheet. In accounts, don't we all love spreadsheets? I'm sure. I maybe I'm just a bit weird. Um, but also, you know, and using your staff intranet, but increasingly we've got in communications on social media or um platforms like Teams or even Zoom, what we're on now. So it's good to have an awareness of the different types of um communication methods um that you may need to be using and what the most appropriate communication method might be for um, a particular um, type of communication. Yeah, so would you send an email for it or would you write a letter or would you pop it on the internet um, and maybe ask that based on some particular scenarios. If you do need to, again, I don't know if this will be included very much in your exam, but if you are asked about sort of um, note taking and getting that information collected, we talk about the five R's. So, and again, this, this can be quite useful for your revision because a lot of what you're doing when you're revising is kind of condensing information down or when you're studying as well. Um, so we talk about um, record, oh, I don't want to get dark, let's have a, let's have a look. So we want to, when we're recording, we want to write down all meaningful information that can be difficult because sometimes everything is important. Um, so it might, we're talking about um, things here like dates, um, facts, people's names, things that we may need to um, refer back to later on. Um, and then if we've got any particular ideas and facts, we can use our keywords to summarise those. And then that means that when you go back to your notes later, you should be able to think, oh, yeah, that's when, that's when Bob was talking about um, this new project that we're going to be taking on. It's going to be called this, and this is what it's going to be about, all that sort of thing. Um, if you maybe have seen or heard information, if you then recite it, you are, as it says there, putting it into your own words. Um, so you're not just repeating it back current fashion. So you, the good thing about reciting is that you are showing that you understand what has been said because you're having to put it in your own words. But you're not just repeating, as I say, repeating it back. Um, and then make sure that it's sort of more meaningful for you. 
um, and for the purpose which you'll be using it. So you know kind of why you need to have this information. Another thing that you can do is you can reflect. So we're talking about um, you know, your thoughts, your ideas and your opinions on a particular area. Um, and this can then maybe lead to some questions in your mind, you know, particularly if you've got um, things that happen at work or something that's come up in a meeting. You might think, well, I don't really understand what they're saying on that bit. And then it could maybe lead on to some questions that you want to then ask about at a later date. And then finally, once you've got everything that you need, you can review the notes, sort of skim through them, um, but it still allows you the chance to ask questions if you need to. So, again, I don't know how much that will be covered in your exam, um, but worth having a look at anyway. As I said, the main bulk of what we look at in this task is about workload planning. Generally, tasks, you'll have um, tasks that are regular, um, and you may be aware of this from work, um, that you've got tasks that you will need to do kind of every day or every um, week or a couple of times a week. It might be a case of if you're working in the sales ledger, that every day you're going to need to be checking the bank, uh, to see if any payments have come in, so any receipts have come in from your customers um, the previous day. Um, and then you can get those logs. You'll be doing that every single day to make sure that your accounts are up to date uh, at any one point. So you have got your regular tasks, which we haven't actually mentioned here. But I will make a note of that. And we'll see that in a bit. But then you've got other, ta other types of tasks too. You've got your urgent tasks, and then you've got your important tasks. And Often those priorities can kind of compete with each other and it can be difficult to know um, what you should be doing when. Sometimes you're looking at something which is um, both urgent and important. So it might be that um, your manager has said that they need to get some figures for them um, for a meeting they've got later on that day. Okay, so. It fits the urgency requirement because it's going to be in the next, it's going to be in the next 24 hours. So you've got to kind of do something about it very, very soon. And also it hits the important because it is, um, it's been requested to be done by someone above your position in the organization. So a manager or a director, uh, somebody more senior to you has said, I need you to do this. And that can often make it very important. Other important tasks um, would fall things where if you've got maybe some sort of financial penalty and uh, the consequences of not completing um, that task on time or to meet that deadline are high. For example, um, you are not submitting your VAT return on time. And if you don't do that, it can lead to issues. And it may be that you would have to pay a penalty, which is additional money that was going out. So it's very, very important that you meet that deadline. Um, so, yeah, so the, I think sometimes the importance factor can override the urgent factor. So sometimes we've got tasks that are urgent, but they might not necessarily be important. So it might be that, um, I don't know, the 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 office kitchens run out of milk for people's teas and coffee. So it's quite urgent that you do get some milk in at some point so that people can have their teas and coffees. Um or they can just drink milk if they want. Um, but it's not sort of um it's not necessarily mission critical, if you know what I mean, that we go out and get milk, you know, <laughs> if it ha if we do have some time, if out by all means to the shop and grab yourself a pint of milk. But there may be other things that need to override that. Uh, so it's a, it's important that you can see that which are the which are the things that need to be done first and which are the things that can wait. Um, and because of the reason because of the role that we have in finance, we need to be making sure that we are providing information to other areas of our finance department or even other areas of the business. Uh, we're very much thinking in an industry base here rather than practice, but it, it works in both ways. Um, we are required to uh, provide information 
that meets a lot of um, different characteristics. So we need to make sure that the information fits all of these. Now, this does form part of um, the framework for financial statements, which is more than you need to know at this level. Um, we need to make sure that any information that we are providing and financial data, that it is comparable. We can maybe look at this year's budget compared to last year's. And we're, we're comparing the same thing. So what we thought we would get in sales last year is the same definition as what we've got in sales this year. So we're not including um, things that we didn't include last year. So that we can say, right, well, last year we sold £500,000 of this product. And this year we sold a million pounds of this product. We have done a lot better. The information needs to be consistent and needs to be understandable. So again, consistent and comparable kind of feature in the same way that we are um, we're displaying the data in the same way. It's, under, it's understandable for um, a non-finance person, but someone who has no accounting knowledge to pick it up and go, oh, I can see that the sales they got are £100,000 last year and they've got a million pounds this year, and they understand that that is a good thing. Um, it also needs to be relevant and timely. I've kind of slotted those two together, but it, when I say relevance, it needs to be able to inform decision makers and help to kind of decide, make them decide what they're going to do in a timely manner, in a decent time frame. It's absolutely pointless to provide financial data from like five years after they needed it. It's a bit of an extreme example, but generally decision makers in a business want to know things that are going to affect the company going forward. So you know, we would look at the last year's accounts and say, right, they're all signed off, send them to the decision makers, send them to the shareholders, send them to the directors so that they can see how we're doing. And then that might inform what they decide to do for the next year or even the next five years. So they need to be relevant and they need to be timely. They also need to be reliable. Um, so are the figures, um, what's the basis of those figures? Where does it come from? Can we link it back to our invoices and our credit notes? And even the adjustments that we might make through such as journals. And you've seen that, I'm sure, in your bookkeeping. Um, we also may need to make use of digital technologies. Uh, and there is a question about this. So we need to know about the differences between data collection, data processing, and distribution, also known as dissemination of information. And there is a question on this in a bit. So data collection is basically compiling the numbers together. I want to make a note of this so that you've got it. So that's, that's oh, oh dear, there we go. So that's your kind of, um, if I say getting the data, Data processing, that is your, that's your analysis. So it might be that you are maybe doing a little bit of thinking about um, the costing uh, units that you, I'm sure you've done already. Um, things like variance analysis, you know, looking at the budgets and the actuals and trying to kind of get that data um, into some sort of meaningful context rather than just being a whole list of figures we're able to, um, Put it into some meaningful context and then distribution of information that is kind of the um, um kind of getting the information um out there as it were so like out to our directors managers the decision makers of business but there is a question on that so we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit and explain it a bit more in this task, you may also be asked about um, data protection, data security. Um, obviously, we this is very much a hot, much more of a hotter topic now than it maybe was um, maybe ten plus years ago. The Data Protection Act has been in place for a very, very long time. I remember learning about the Data Protection Act when I was an AAT student a long, long time ago. Um, however, it has now been um, replaced, as I'm sure you will know. What has it been replaced by? We used to do some work. I've talked long enough. Do you know what it's now? What the legislation is now? 
don't want to go, but it's probably something that you will have heard of. I'll go with it. So you've now got um, legislation relating to GDPR, certainly in um, in Europe. Anyway, we are kind of part of that more widely, um, which is a much more stringent um, way of make, well, set of rules, basically. So you're making sure that um, we are not allowing sensitive or personal data to be let out into the wider world. So we have to make sure that data is um, stored and um, collected and stored in the, in the right way. Um, and also that it's destroyed when it's no longer needed. Um, people have the right to know what information is held about them as well. There's a lot in there. And every business, it, it will apply to them because everyone, every business has information that it holds and um, maybe needs to pass on to other um, companies. For example, if you're, you've got a company that delivers things, you've got to put addresses and your contact details to that delivery company. There's, there's a lot of things to be considered. Um, and it might be that you are asked about uh, things to do with data security and information security. Um, but so there's nothing in particular on this, um, on this past example question. Which I think we will get on to now because we've got plenty to look at and I have talked for long enough. So we're starting off easing quite nicely for part A. We have three, um, I'm just going to number them, one, two and three. We've got three different tasks there. We've got our VAT return, we've got our extended trial balance, so we've got our annual budget. And then we've got three different roles in the uh, finance function, and I'm going to letter those. Um, we've got our management accountant, we've got our financial accountant, we've got our tax accountant. Now this is very much looking at the different branches of the finance department and who looks after what. So we have to match one, fun one uh, task to one person. So any thoughts on that to kick off with? Um, who's going to be doing the VAT return? Who's going to be doing the trial balance? Who's going to be doing the annual budget? Um, and again, this will call on your knowledge that you may have had from other units about the difference between financial accounting and management accounting. I'll let you have a think about that. You can say like, you know, 1A, 2B, 3C. Uh, that return would be a tax accountant. Indeed, it would. There we go. So we'll link that one up. So we've got the tax accountant's job. Oh, excuse me. It's you. Um, so we've just got to decide who does the extended trial balance and who does the budget. I'm just going to turn my camera off for a second. Just sort myself out. What do you think about those other two? Oh, that's better. Right, I'm back. Okay, so we think two would be A, okay. So that would mean two and three B. I'm going to disagree with you on um, number two being for the management accountant. In some companies, management accountants do get involved with adjustments. Um, I have, that's something that I have done in, in any sort of previous management accountant roles that I've had. However, our extended trial balance is dealing with financial data. Uh, it's not dealing with projections, forecasting, any kind of forward planning. It's very much the financial data, the actual data from our invoices and our credit notes, etc., our payments, our receipts. So it would technically be our financial accountant that does the extended trial balance. But I'm, I, I can see why that is essentially um, well, like people might say, well, I think it's a management accountant. For some companies, the, the adjusting side of things does fall into the unit of management accountant. However, the reason that I say that the financial accountant does the extended trial balance is because we've got a budget here. So the annual budget, that is very much a forecasting um, task. It's a forward planning. It's not dealing with actual financial data. So we leave that to our management accountant. So that's where the distinction comes. But I still think that's quite a nice task to, uh, to ease us in for this first one. Okay, this question is very much lots of little bits. So we're gonna have another look at another 
completely separate question now. And this is looking a little bit at planning um, and things like that. So we have been attending a training course about planning time and working effectively. We now want to make use of planning aids within the team to address some recent challenges. And we've been given those challenges in this table. Uh, we've also been given a very nice pick list down here. So we need to assign um, one of these to each challenge and how this planning aid could, um, could help us. So we've got our Outlook calendar. So I'm sure, I'm hoping that's something that you're familiar with. Um, I, can't, I was gonna bring mine up, but I won't. So I've got a few things in there to keep that out. Um, so what I mean that is with your Outlook calendar, you're able to see um, when people are available. Uh, when people might have meetings, and uh, but you can also sort of send out invites and get responses as to whether people can attend meetings at a certain time. You've got a scheduler, which can be a little bit like a timetable um, or um, a bit of a plan. For example, um, one of my previous jobs used to have a year end, and it was like a month end even scheduler, where we would write out all the tasks that needed to happen to make sure that our month end process was smooth and that everything got done and nothing got missed and then we would sort of say who was responsible for each task and we would then when we've done that task we'd go and sign it and date it to say that we've done that task and when we've done it and actually that worked really really well um, and it sort of kept us all on track and it also meant that if someone was on holiday when it was um, month end which was rare but it happened um, we could pick up on the tasks that they were supposed to be doing. So a scheduler kind of helps you to plan when certain tasks will be completed or when they need to be completed by. And then our final one that we've got to pick from is our to-do list, which I'm hoping you will be quite familiar with. Um, it's can be quite informal, really. I mean, I, I write myself a to-do list when I start work most days, just to kind of keep my brain on track and make sure I don't forget anything that I said I, I would do that day. Okay, so those are the three things that we're going to need to allocate to these challenges. So we've got number one, we need to arrange a meeting, but we don't know when our team are going to be available. Um, our second one is that we know we need to know when our colleagues will complete certain tasks, so we can then make sure we've got enough time to review those tasks. And then final one, you sometimes lose track of activities that you need to do personally because you get distracted and forget about them. Haven't we all been there? So we need to say which one of those we will use the calendar for, which one we'll use the scheduler for, and which one we will use the to-do list for. So I'll let you know think about that. And uh, take any 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 offers that you want to give me about which one is which. First one we think would be an Outlook calendar. Yeah, absolutely. That was we, we discussed that, didn't we? I'll just put Outlook in that. I can fit it, I can fit calendar and uh, put that in in my terrible writing. <laughs> so we can tick off Outlook calendar, we've used that one, and we would only look to use one each time really on this question. So what do we need to do for the other two? What would be our most appropriate methods for the other two? I'll just give you another. Another few seconds, I think. Not sure. Okay, I'll 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 keep this one going. So for the second one, we need to know when our colleagues will complete certain tasks so then we've got enough time to review them. So that's again a bit like I was saying with our scheduler, which is our answer for this one. We've got a bit of a timetable so we know when uh, maybe our direct reports or other people in our team are going to be completing certain tasks within the month so that things are done on time and it gives us enough time to make sure that that work has been completed correctly. So that's our scheduler done. And then our last one would be our, our to do list um, because that is again very much more of a personal thing and just making sure that we don't get lost or distracted um, and forget about things that we need to do. So yeah, that is our to-do list. That's our part B done. Right. I said that we would have a question on the different ways of dealing with data and we have got one here. 
So again, completely different scenario from part B. We're now looking to be part of a project team and we're looking at the use of digital technologies to enable data collection. In fact, I'm going to highlight these data collection, data processing and dissemination of information. Remember what we said before, dissemination of information means sending the information to the people that need it. Okay, so it's quite a big word, but it's a, something that's basically quite straightforward. We've got a number of opportunities, which we've got in this bit here. Um, hopefully, I'll get rid of that in a minute, but just to, have, just to bring it to your attention. Um, and we need to decide whether each of these following opportunities will be used for collecting data, for processing that data, so that's the analysis, and for disseminating the information, for getting it out there. So we've got we've got four options here and only three in our pick list, so we will need to use um, one of them a second time. So we've got the marketing team can use social media to publicize a new product as our data collection, processing or dissemination. The plant machinery can generate systems reports about production efficiency when maintenance is due, so that production, processing, or dissemination. Your accounting software can integrate with your online banking to automatically perform a bank reconciliation, so what we're doing with the data there. And then the management team can see a snapshot of how the business is performing on a dashboard. I think this question is quite tricky um, because you have to sort of think about what um, what needs to be done. I will number these just in case anybody's got any thoughts. But yeah, and you can just say collection, processing or dissemination if that makes it easier in the chat. So number and which one you think it is. Got any ideas? I'll just give you a minute to think about that. Don't worry, this is maybe feeling a little bit overwhelming. This is quite different. It's one of those questions that's a little bit different compared to um, some of the different areas on this unit really. Compared to what we've done before with previous AOT syllabuses. Yeah. Right, got a, we've got um, one there which I don't disagree with. But now make sure that I spell dissemination properly. But yes, absolutely. That fourth on the, the snap, the dashboard is very much disseminating information. The data has been collected, it's been analysed, and it's there for um, management to, to see. So yeah, absolutely. Well done on that one. Uh, any others? Any others? It says it's quite difficult to distinguish whether somebody is data collection or data processing. Um, but yeah, I can, uh, I can provide more, more help on that. I said that uh, one of these terms we'd need to use more than once. Um, the one that we will need to use more than once is the one that I can't spell, which is dissemination of information, because um, this first one, I should use a different color, this first one is getting the information out there. The marketing team is using um, information on the new product and getting it out there on social media. So they are doing a bit of dissemination of information on that one. But that's quite a difficult one to pick up. So we then need to decide whether two and three are either processing of the data or collecting the data. Any thoughts on those? It's difficult to see, I think, with this one. Number two, the plant machinery reports. That is basic data collection. The machine is just churning out information about um, what the churning information about, um, about um, production efficiency and when maintenance is due. They're probably just churning out dates um, and random numbers for want of a better word so there's not really any substance behind those um, and somebody who maybe is not um, a regular user of um, the reports from that machine may struggle to know what the data means um, so that's it's very much a raw data set 
uh, rather than something that's been analysed. On the flip side, though, the fact that we, in number three, are doing a bank reconciliation, which is a form of analysis. Yeah, we're having to check our um, cash book against our bank statement. Um, means that we are doing some sort of analysis, as we say. So that is actually going to be data processing. So yeah, a bit of a tricky task. To finish off, we're going to have a little look a bit more at workload planning. Now, this is not new. AAT have loved to do workload planning tasks for level two um, since the beginning of time. It's a really effective way of demonstrating to students and getting students to think about um, how they're best to plan what they're doing. Um, and you will be presented with some sort of timetable, or like we've got here, a bit of a schedule, oh, there we go, um, of different tasks, when they need to happen, and how long they're going to take you, okay? So we've got that here. We've got quite a few tasks here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got eight tasks. We're told when we need to do them by, and for some of them, that is every single day. Uh, we've got other ones where it's just one day a week. We've got one there, the sales invoices that we need to do twice a week. Um, and also how long it's going to take us. Um, and then the frequency. So not only are we being told that the emails, we need to answer them, every day we actually need to look, be looking at them at twice every day so that's going to mean that we're going to have two hours out of our um, day that we need to be spending answering emails ideally it's a little bit arbitrary because we don't probably put a time limit on how often we how much time we spend answering emails every day i know i don't it's just as and when um but all of the other tasks we're either completing weekly so that's just that one hour on a monday for the team meeting for example um for the sales invoice, we are doing them twice weekly, so we spend two hours on a Monday, and then um, and then two hours on a Wednesday. Okay. With questions like this, what I would do is I'd have a brief look at that data, but what is more important is to see what the question is asking you, because there's a lot there's a lot to be found in that. Um, and I think you can sort of look at look at the, look at that table and think, oh gosh, there's a lot there. Whereas if you then scroll down and have a look, you can see that they're basically they're not asking you to come up with any kind of timetable of when you're going to be completing these tasks. They just want to know on which days you're going to be busiest with those routine tasks. Um, in the question information at the start, it talks about um, your working hours and your lunch each day but you want to attend a three-hour training course okay and your manager has said yes that's absolutely fine however you need to find a suitable day when you have got time to do that okay you're also told that your hours are from 9 a.m until 5 p.m so that's a standard eight hour working day yeah so you've got I'm just going to pop that in there. We've got eight hours. It's an eight. However, you need to take an hour for lunch. So if you've got minus lunch, you've got actually you've got seven hours each day. Okay. So you've got to make sure that you're not going over those um, hours. So they want to know what day you're going to be busiest with routine tasks. We'll have a look at that, we'll see which days um, are looking pretty busy. And then we've got to decide which day would be best for attending the training course. So when we say that what day would be best, what are we maybe thinking about in terms of our daily tasks and the time that we've got available? Which, you know, the day that we have the least, uh, least tasks to do and the least time tied up is probably the best one to attend that training course. And then once we've selected the particular day for attending the course we then also need to say how many hours we will have remaining on that day after you've done those routine tasks and you've attended the training course which is three hours so if we go back up to the first bit this is our last bit on this task 
we're being asked to look at the day will be busiest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, no, I want it up there so I can see the table. I want to look at each day, if I can fit it all in, I might need to just put Friday there. I'm going to go for each day in turn and think with this question, another thing to bear in mind is be really methodical with it. Um, make sure that you're looking at each day in turn, that you're putting tasks in in the right order if you have got a time table to complete. Um, but think about what you've got. So if we have a look on a Monday, we are told that we've got, um, I think I'll do, I'll, if I can, I'll try and highlight things as best I can um, in the colour. So Monday, we're looking for stuff that we're going to have in pink. So we've got anything with Monday on, we've got, oh, we've got the team meeting for an hour and we've got two hours to process the sales invoices. Okay. Anything else for a Monday? Yeah. The trap that people sometimes fall into with this is that they don't take into account the daily tasks. So I'm just going to pop a little bit of pink in there because we've got two hours um, for that. So I'm just going to make a note that that is actually. Yeah, so we've got two hours per day on those. So on a Monday, we've got two hours for emails. We've got an hour for the team meeting and then two hours for um, those invoices. So we are already tied up for one, two, three, four, five hours. So we've got two hours free. Yeah, so. We're probably not going to be fitting that training course in on Monday because they've got two hours free and we need three hours um, out of our seven, which we haven't got. We'll then have a look at Tuesday. We'll use a different colour for Tuesday. We'll have a nice orange for Tuesday. I think we'll go with that one. Again, what have we got on a Tuesday? Not a huge amount. We've got the deck chasing that we're going to do. And yet again, we've got two hours of emails. So we've got two hours of emails, three hours of uh, outstanding debt. So actually, even though our Tuesday doesn't look that busy, we've got the same number of hours tied up as we have on a Monday. So we're working for five hours, meaning that we've got two hours free out of our seven. Right, we'll have a look at Wednesday, middle of the week. Some people call it hump day. Don't you want Wayne Clark? <laughs> we've got a couple of tasks on a Wednesday, we've got two hours on those sales invoices and then we've got three hours to prepare the reports. We've also got a couple of hours on the emails yet again. So we've got three hours there on those reports. We've got two hours on these, that's five. And then actually our Wednesday is entirely <laughs> booked up because we have got seven hours. So we haven't got, we've got zero hours free on a Wednesday. So I don't think we'll be doing that training course on a Wednesday. <laughs> Have a look at Thursday. Maybe things might start to clear up for us here. Because we've got, and now we've got a meeting once one with our manager for an hour. And then again, we've got two hours of those emails that we've had every day so far this week. So we've got two hours on the emails. One hour on those on those um, our manager um, meeting, so that's actually only three hours. So we've still got four hours out of our seven freed up. Finally, everyone's favourite day of the week. It's Friday. We're gonna have two hours on the emails. We've got an hour on taking cash to the bank. And then we've got three hours where we're going to be reconciling our statements. So actually, our Friday is looking quite busy. Um, sometimes that is the case. Last day of the week, and you're trying to get all the jobs done that you need to do. So we've got, again, two hours on those emails. Uh, an hour on the cash the bank, so that's three hours. And then three hours on the statements. So that means that we're working. We've got tasks already. Six hours, meaning only one hour is free. 
so the question is asking us first of all which day are we the busiest with our routine tasks well the answer is it's going to be this one isn't it wednesday because we have zero free time on that wednesday we can save it oh and hold on to the screen bobbing about so yeah our wednesday is our busiest day we have zero free time on that day and you can see how the fact that we were quite methodical with our workings on that we've been able to really quickly and clearly see um which of our days were the busy ones which is where they are actually highlighted on those so you can see what we're doing okay we've now got to look at which day would be best for attending the training course so we're looking for the, the day when we've got at least three hours free because if you remember in the question it said that the, the fintech training course was three hours long so we need at least that time again i think it's jumping out at us we've only really got one day that we can use because all the other days we don't either have no time or we have less than three hours so the only day that we can attend the training course would be the thursday yeah and then to finish off we are asked how much time would we have remaining on that Thursday after we've completed the task and attended the course? So we've got our routine tasks are going to take us three hours. The course is also three hours. So we're using six hours. Um, that we are working, if you like, put that in, in a little bit of brackets, which means that um, we've got seven hours in the day, minus the six hours, means that we've got one hour, three, in effect. So, uh, so we really wouldn't need our calculations tonight, but a little bit of calculation for that, but nothing too, too strenuous. So that is a good example for task two, uh, and that is where we will leave it for um, this evening. I hope that you have enjoyed that. I'm just going to pull my slides back up um, and give you this one. So there you go. Thanks very much for attending this one tonight. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and if you've got any questions, our contact email address is there. Um, and please feel free to get in touch. But yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>